You're listening to the Vanu Podcast, the podcast making you invulnerable to the coercion of the state and the servile society. Visit our website for free resources to aid you in your pursuit of self-liberation. Old Vanu publications, podcasts, guest articles, and much more. Go to vanupodcast.com. And now, your hosts, Shane and Jason. Hey guys, Shane here with a brief introduction to the newest Building the Second Realm episode here on our Vanu podcast re-release of the series. Now I'll make this quick today, but this episode is titled The Blessings of Technology and was originally released on April 8th, 2018. Or and just for the sake of details, uh, it was at, I think it was the 8th episode in our BTSR series. In Second Realm Book on Strategy, Smuggler and XYZ have a similarly titled section uh, wherein they discuss how modern technological advancements like encryption and other anonymizing technologies can br- help bring to fruition as, as well as uh, help to maintain Second Realms. Of course, I am in 100% agreeance, uh, but one comment. I'm at the point now where I believe dual-layer encryption is becoming an absolute necessity for online communications, not just a potential option. Uh, we talk a bit about that in this episode, so if you're new to the concept, uh, hang in there. Uh, hang in there. Um, now, one final thing before I turn you over to this episode, um, as I've mentioned in basically every uh, the introduction to every one of these episodes, if you would like to snag a copy of uh, the Second Round Book on Strategy audiobook, uh, you can get it for free um, by signing up for a 30-day free trial on Audible ACX. Uh, that's libertyunderattack.com forward slash SR Audio. Again, libertyunderattack.com forward slash SR Audio to get a... Uh, to get a, a free cop, a free digital download of it, and uh, or you can go to libertyunderattack.com forward slash sraudio2 uh, to purchase off the LUA site. Uh, one other thing, uh, if you'd like to read hashtag Agora, the incredible crypto Agorist novella, if you want to get a free a free copy of this book um, or all of the episodes uh, ahead of time, you can go to libertyunderattack.com forward slash second realm. And of course, uh, links to all of these things can be found in the show notes below. So I think that about covers it. Uh, please enjoy this episode, and uh, yeah, until ne- until next time, let's uh, let's get building. I would just say this: <sighs> technology can actually enable human liberty, or as is the case with some other things, actually more more precisely put, it can enable Vanu. You know, Vanu enables other Vanu, uh, so to speak, or in- or Vanu increases other forms of Vanu, and so. When we're looking at tyranny, when we're looking at coercion, we have to see, like, what are the tools in the tool belt to actually for individuals to deal with this kind of thing? And I think technology is a very important role to play. And this is why I don't particularly care for the anarcho-primitivists or versions thereof, because they think technology was essentially co-opted by the state and is essentially used by the state to oppress people. But then again, technology is also a double-edged sword. It can be used for good or for evil. I mean, think about a pen. Actually, hell, let, actually, let's let's tie this in with an old economic concept. Wooden pencils, like Leonard Reed's eye pencil, okay? You can ha- use a – yes, it is very much. It basically teaches people about spontaneous order, which, by the way, little little secret spoiler, that's, that's what that whole essay was about. Eye pencil was all about how spontaneous order works, by the way, and why um, – Central planning can never work because you can't actually have a single – you can't actually have anybody actually fully understand all the intricate processes that could actually go into manufacturing. But anyway, that, that's an economic discussion for another time. The point is is that if you look at something like a pencil, a wooden pencil, a relatively simple invention still around that enabled so much, so much, so much other stuff because it's a tool – a pencil can be used to create, to innovate, to jot, to transmit or communicate ideas, to create works of art, to to write manifestos, uh, freedom manifestos. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, if in a more philosophical sense, sure. To develop science, to discover more things and scientifically explain them, right? Pencils can be used for that. Pencils can also be used to murder people. Pencils can be used to uh, coerce people into making confessions, especially if you threaten to stab them in the eye. Won't kill them if you know how to do it right. You can scare the living shit out of somebody with just a sharp, nice, sharp wooden pencil. Pencils can be, you can torture somebody with a pencil too if you stab them in the foot or the hand or the wrist enough. Pencils can be used for a lot of things. Just ask your local neighborhood friendly ex cons, okay? I don't mean to be a jerk here. 
I'm simply pointing out the reality that tools, that technology can be used for good or for ill. So digital technology, just in a, as a huge class, can be used as part of a big, a big Brother surveillance system where you have an Internet of Things, stuff that Catherine Albrecht has been screaming bloody murder about for years, can be used as an Internet of Things where everything is scanned and tracked and traced and there's no privacy anywhere. And basically um, our great overseers who imagine themselves as such basically use it as a form as a panopticon of sorts to make sure that nobody can ever escape the grid. That's true. However, technology can also be used, and this is the part where, unfortunately, I think maybe Elbrick and company maybe should have emphasized a little bit. But then again, I don't want to totally crap on her because she's got enough of enough of a job as it is. Technology can also be used to liberate individuals. Cryptocurrencies can get us all, can help encourage people to get off Federal Reserve notes. Technology can enable people to actually practice firearms ownership and use. Even if every single firearm was was suddenly suddenly becoming black market, like it is in Japan and other places, um, technology can be used in a lot of different ways. You know, it can be used for good or for ill. And I think people not really appreciating the double edged nature of it can lead them to make some assumptions that maybe they necess- they shouldn't necessarily have. Like, yeah, there is the issue of, like, the cashless society. Yeah, sure. Hell, I've written about it. I am very familiar with the cashless society. Yeah, or, or everything government does being centralized onto, uh, you know, a blockchain, you know, making, you know, a government identification digital instead of physical. I mean, there are a lot of really tyrannical things that can be done with technology. Yeah, um, sure. Yeah you're, you're, yeah, you're exactly correct. It's a double-edged sword. And, um, you know, thankfully, a lot of the negative... Uh, applications of technology can be remedied by proper applications of technology. Or I guess not proper. That's putting a sort of value value uh, value on it. Um, proper so, in this. Let's put it this way: proper in the sense that it can enable liberty and or vanu. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So, technology. Let me put it this way: technology itself innately is neutral. That's probably the most fair and accurate and most closely empirical way of putting it. Technology is neutral. It's it's a dumb. It's even it's even more neutral than a dumb animal because animals have instincts and they have you know preferences at least to some degree. Um, it's more technology is more like actually furniture. Furniture is actually a form of technology, by the way. You know this freaking chair I'm sitting in right now is actually a technology. There's actually a lot of different things that go into this chair, right? There's the swivels and the arms and the, the little hydraulic pump thingy, and then there's the cushion, and then there's, you know, there's actually quite a bit that actually goes into manufacturing this cheap chair I'm sitting in. <laughs> you know, um, not, to, not to mention all the other forms of technology that we're using to make this broadcast happen right now. It's no joke. Yeah, so you know, for people who may think technology is awful, we have to go, we have to rewild like uh, some guys who uh, shall go unnamed here, but who I think mean well. But then when you actually go through step by step, I think technology can also be used to restore the environment, physical environment, and also because I'm an environmentalist, like I've said before, I think technology properly applied can be used to first get the physical environment back to snuff where it's not like a polluted cesspit and second i think technology can also be used to preserve it at least at least in many ways or at least keep it in a uh, a suitable habitat for humans and and of course the the dumb animals and so forth um and i i, th- I think that's i think that's wonderful i mean um i think it is possible to essentially have a synthesis but the intention has to be there and then once the intention is there and it's stable and it's consistent, then the scientific advancements and developments will follow that intention. But if the intention's not there, it's not going to happen, which is why you have a lot of nasty pollution. You have a vi- you actually have violations of property rights, which is ironically why the pollution and other things happen. And Murray's, Murray Rothbard mentioned decades ago and so forth. So technology is not the enemy here. It's tyrants and, and despots who basically want everybody crushed under their foot. It's the state that's the enemy here. Yes, yes. That's a long introduction, but I like it. I like it. So Our uh, enemy, the state, man. <laughs> Our enemy, the state. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So today's episode is number 13 in the series and is titled, as you guys should clearly be able to figure out, The Blessings of Technology. Technology plays a major role in the building and maintenance of second realms, in addition to, being, uh, in addition to just being t- uh, terrific tools uh, for personal freedom. 
As we've discussed, Second Realms can exist wholly in cyberspace, utilizing end-to-end encryption, deep web services, deep web marketplaces, and anonymous digital currencies, among others. Technology can also help with physical Second Realms as well, and uh, that's what we're going to talk about uh, here today. So, uh, any other thoughts before we get into it, or can we go ahead and read some excerpts? I, I think I'll, I'll make some comments toward the end regarding some pop culture depictions of, like, uh, um, like um, I can't think of the genre right offhand. I'll remember it later. But basically where technology is used in a tyrannical way, like in some, oh, dystopias and all that. Uh, like cyberpunk, that's what it's called. Like in cyberpunk dystopias. I want to mention that more towards the end, but no, nothing for now. Okay. All right, so uh, second round book on strategy. If you have not read it, read it. If uh, you want to follow along with us, just go to anaplex.net and you can find it there. Or just find it in the show notes. So the blessings of technology. Quote, Many of the tasks we are confronted with seem to be impossible to solve at first glance. And just a few decades ago, that would have been a correct assessment. Luckily for us, technological advantages of the last 30 years open up new opportunities. Anonymized remote controlled access control. Quote, One day there will be a banging on the door leading to one of our protected places. Police, we have a search warrant. Now is the time for the ice-cold second realm security provider to, pr- to prove what he is worth. Sheepishly pressing the button to immediately open the door and putting everyone inside into peril, or doing nothing except sending out a warning to everyone and letting the attackers work their way through the concrete reinforced gate. The combination of remote CCTV perimeter control and communication anonymity greatly reduces the potential consequences for the remote bouncer and gives him the freedom to act in the interest of his customers. To further add security, multiple anonymous operators located at different unknown locations could be required to agree on an action so that neither infiltration, bribery, blackmail, or pure fear can undermine the security of the temporary autonomous zone, end quote. So let's go ahead and just stop there for a moment. So as you can tell from the from the excerpt, it's uh, a way to, uh, you know, an off-site security provider to ensure the safety of a second realm. Uh, it's a really interesting application of this. You know, this kind of already exists to a certain extent, but not used for this specific purpose. So uh, I think it's a uh, an interesting idea. Now, I will raise one kind of concern, but thankfully, uh, you know, the folks at Interplex and a lot of these folks are really, really incredible crypto anarchists. The only, I guess, concern I would have is, I guess, uh, <laughs> you know, since it, they would be connected to some sort of an Internet, that they would be hackable. And uh, that would not be good for anybody involved, So, especially if it was the state. So what do you have? There's different ways to kind of um, look at this. So anonymized remote-controlled access control. So the anonymized part is kind of obvious. Remote control – and the access control is just more uh, passageways, doorways, other types of entrances and exits and so forth. It's probably the remote controlled part that's probably the most interesting. So, like, what does that mean? Does that mean that your so called ice cold second realm security provider is actually on site or is he off site? I think should be the first question we need to address here. Right. Oh, yeah, off site. That's, yeah, that's, that's what they say here. Uh, that increases the security, especially if you're, if there's going to be any entrepreneurs that take up the field of security for second realms, they're not going to want to be in a place where they're vulnerable to the coercion of the state or other private criminals, right? So off-site, remotely, uh, makes it a, a lot safer uh, for an entrepreneur to enter, enter into that area. So I guess what they're saying is off-site. I'm sure there might be ways where there could be security on-site, obviously, but uh, for the purposes of uh, anonymized remote-controlled access control, that uh, well, it was redundant as that statement is, or that heading. Uh, <laughs> you know, the the idea is for them to be off site. So I think that'd be the first uh, the first answer to that. Well, I guess that's one way that this could kind of go down. But let me uh, play devil's advocate here for your attackers, Please. whether they be whether they be organized crime or uh, the government. Uh, you know, uh, douchebag. You know, the king's guards, as it were, the blue coats. I would sort the bludge. I would say. Okay, let's say I'm the captain of my SWAT unit, and I need to basically take down this. Op- let's just call it the opium den. Okay, I know it's. I know in America there's not really opium dens. It's more of something that happens in China. But let's go ahead and go with that. Okay, I'm the captain of my local SWAT team, and my assignment from the chief is to take down the opium den because they bad people, <laughs> right? Or on drugs. Okay. If I've got snitches and informants and whatever else, hopefully they would have told me by now by doing my homework and getting some people in there and all that, that 
I might not know all the details of their security layout, but I do know that they at least have a few cameras and the cameras rely on internet. So the first thing I'd be thinking about is maybe not necessarily hacking because that takes skills, but also my particular police department just doesn't have enough in the city budget to cover that because, well, they can give us Kevlar and flak jackets and full auto and wraps and all that. Shit, uh-huh. but. <laughs> but yeah, hiring, a, but hiring a programmer, man, you know, whew, those tech guys really make bank, right? Yeah. And they work for good. Well, I guess they, yeah, when they work for government, they definitely do. Yeah. 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 So what I'm kind of getting at is this little thing called wire cutters. Yeah. You know, if, if you can find out where those, those cables are and all that, just snippety snip, snip, snip. Now, that's not necessarily going to solve everything. It'll probably solve a lot, but not solve everything. So, like, what if it's wireless? Well, anyone ever heard of, like, a cell phone jammer? I'm not necessarily saying it would work, but if my department's a little hard up, we'll try anything. Um, What else? What other options? I mean, like, seriously, let me, like, walk everybody through this hypothetical, like, like, and by the way, SWAT teams do this before they do raids. They actually have, like, meetings and shit about how they're going to fucking oppress people, okay? At At least the halfway professional ones do. So let's pretend we're the bludge and we're basically sitting around the thing. Like, how are we going to attack this? How are we going to attack these people and oppress them and coerce them and stuff? Well, I think, I, I think though, there's one solution. I mean, hidden cameras exist, right? You can hide, you can hide cameras in really obscure places where no okay, one so can, know. Okay, so we know. So we know. Okay, so let's say fine. Let's okay. That's fair. Let's modify the the scenario a little bit. Let's say my informants told me there are security cameras, but they can't find them. Okay, they know so, that, so then, so then the jammers, you know, the fair. internet jammers, you know, that could still be effective. Uh, mm, maybe depending. I mean, let, here, here's an interesting question. We know we the bludge. We know that the uh, the opium den of Agoras and so forth. We know that uh, you know they have their own servers, but we don't know the exact location of them. But they might be at the location. They might not be. We'll have to find out when we get there. Because we, it's a little hard to get, like, you know, blueprints, which would be ideal if you were going to go oppress people so that you know where the infill and exfill points are. But we don't know that. So we're going a little blind, which means this is a higher stakes. Um, yeah, there's probably going to be some, C, uh, you know, um, oh, what's the freaking term? CQB going on there. So if that's the case, and we're probably going to have to, like, you know, literally bludgeon people while we're there, close quarters battle and all that. Um... It would kind of serve that maybe just in case the servers were on site, we have some wire cutters. That's one of the first things I think of as a, as more of a, a low-tech solution to a high-tech problem for us, the state, um, is is kind of dealing with that. So even if they do have off-site personnel protecting the place, all we have to go is snip, 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 and those yeah, damn and site people can't yeah. do shit. But then again, it's not a guarantee. We Our intelligence is not that good. Our informants only told us so much because they could only find out so much. Now, I guess some, let, me, let, me posit something. let me posit something real quick, though. So with Second sure. Realms, obviously one aspect of that is Second Realm infrastructure. Mm-hmm. So if this is a technology that they've never seen before, I mean, kind of mm-hmm. like a lodging of Wavefrang men, they've never seen this sort of computer, this computer setup where a free digital economy is hidden within a video game to start with. Mm-hmm. Um, they've never seen anything like this. They don't even know it actually exists. So if, uh, you know, the second realm, which they, I mean, they would probably use, you know, mesh networking or something like that, some sort of other technology, then um, it would be, you know, they wouldn't, they wouldn't know how to hack it. Uh, they wouldn't know where to look for it if, it, if, and to even find out if it existed. Um, I mean, the feel, I feel like that would be a pretty, pretty good solution uh, to any, I guess, uh, you know, destruction of, you know, cameras, the internet or the, uh, the, the connection, the ne- connectivity um, means that they're using uh, the uh, security people. I don't know. I think that would. I think that would solve a lot of these problems that, that you're that you're mentioning here. Uh, that second realm infrastructure. Well, of course. And then at Which that is point, the idea, yeah. 
okay, then if we're going to modify the scenario again to take into account what you said, which I think are all good points, then basically the SWAT team is pretty much going in blind. Even if their informants yep. did give them a few details here and there, they're still pretty much going in blind. And I wouldn't be surprised if uh, some of the SWAT members, especially the ones that were maybe not necessarily on the first rotation, decided, you know what, I've got a couple weeks of vac- vacation time coming up. I think I'm going to take the, the family to San Padre Island. <laughs> You know, I'm just going to take it out of town. See you guys. Have fun getting killed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then, and also another possibility, too, that uh, uh, obviously the security at Second Realms has to be top-notch. That's what, what, I mean, that's that's understandable. I think we can all agree on that. So I could see, uh, you know, as, as, a mean, as a means of deterrence, having, you know, like uh, maybe fake cameras or something like that set up, you know, as decoys for, you know, them to try to hack into, and then, you know, there could be access gained into their system that could fuck all their shit up. I don't know, there's a lot of, like, we're, we're talking about hypothetical Ooh. scenarios here, but I could see some sort of means of deterrence being used uh, to trick the state, because they're not very smart, they're not very competent. <laughs> Uh, they may have a lot of money, but they don't know what the hell they're doing most of the time. So I don't know. There's there's a lot of ways we can go with this. But yeah, let's continue the scenario here if you've got anything sure. else. Sure. Well, I mean, I would say, you know, don't underestimate some individuals who work for the state when it comes to things like uh, psychological manipulation, all that, because they, they've got that stuff down pretty pat. However, that being said, I think you are right in terms of like technological competency where it's just, it's just not there. Um, and you have to also keep in mind a lot of them, at least the more experienced one, generationally are more like Generation X – or excuse me. Um, actually, no, I am right. Generation X and older. Uh, boomers are the older ones, obviously, and so forth. So, like, they're not they're not all there. And, you know, you know, they're either making jokes about tape decks or vinyl records, and it's like, oh, and you guys have a tough time understanding cryptocurrencies. Yeah, well, that kind of makes sense, right? It's when you were born and so forth. So, sure. um, so yeah, when they try to work on behalf of uh, the so-called government, then, uh, you know, basically throw people in dungeons and such, then, yeah, I mean, the more technological barriers you can kind of, like, you know, smack at them, trick them with. I think is 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 better than not, um, and 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 you you got a that especially devilish idea if there was a way of somehow kind of luring them into like a, a fake uh, a fake decoy camera, but then the second they do that, it relieves, yeah. yeah, something like that where it's uh, it's like more like a bear trap almost, right? It kind of lure, but it doesn't look like one. It kind of lures them in. Honey, yeah, honey pot actually might be might be a better example. Um, kind of lures them in and then. <laughs> Oh, your entire systems have a nasty worm in it. How did that happen? Well, yep, then maybe and that could you should... be used, uh, and that could be used uh, as an avenging angel tactic. Uh, you know, <laughs> maybe maybe as a you know premeditation, so to speak. Where, mm-hmm. um, uh, yeah, you uh, n- not to influence the first realm because the the two are clearly distinguished, and said the second realm should not you know try to you know. Uh, assassinate the the rulers of the first realm or change the laws or anything like that. So it could just be an avenging angels tactic that, like we talked about in the assassination politics episode, that uh, that two part series, where uh, you know if they try to, then you know there's always a trap set up in place where you know they'll, they'll you know the the ha- the crypto anarchists will find a way into the back door of the system and say, hey, you need to leave, <laughs> you need to leave, or you're gonna lose all this shit. So uh, you you make the decision here, bud. Uh, so I could see a lot of that coming into play, where it doesn't actually change the first realm, but it's a means of defense uh, and deterrence from aggression of the state and the servile society. Yeah, it's like the digital version of man trapping. By the way, I do make a recommendation, Ragnar Benson's Man Trapping. I wrote a book report a while back. Fantastic book. However, it's more like using logs and stones and, and tree branches and, and other types of things that where you're changing the physical environment to make like lethal traps, like stuff the Viet Cong did, like with fun things. Look up punji sticks when you get a chance. Um, that's not a good way to die. Uh, very slow, painful death. It's actually the infection. It's not even the initial stabbing with, uh, with, the, with the sharpened stick smeared with feces on it. That's not actually what God. kills you. It's not the stab. It's the infection because you can't pry your poor leg off that freaking thing because you're now sunk into it. So, yeah, man trapping. So, yeah, the man trapping is kind of an acquired skill. Um, I think what you're kind of getting at is more like almost like a digital version of, of man trapping if there was a way of kind of like screwing up their computer systems and such. And, it, you know, if they, if, they, if they transgressed a boundary or something, then a tripwire is well tripped. 
and then their their stuff goes to pot pretty much. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. So anything else there? Can we uh, and we can we can continue the scenario with the defense systems here. Um, so let's say they have all of the uh, they have the intel that they have, whether it's real or faked or uh, a decoy, and you know they're getting ready to come in, right? They're they're getting ready to they're getting ready to make their move and take out this opium den or this some sort of a second realm. Uh, okay, so anonymized remote controlled defense systems. In a, fur in a future further away, the previous access, access control systems can be extended to incorporate active, less lethal defense systems. The currently available robotic weapons platform, similar to those that are used at the intra-Korean border, could, be in the, could in the future be integrated into the arsenal of specialized TAS defense contractors. Again, anonymous communication and remote sensors of the foundation, but this time extended by random task assignment to, anon to anonymous off-location off operators so that it becomes impossible for any third party to find proof of who pulled the trigger to fend off the attacking street gang, uh, end quote. So, so this is the, the, the way to, def this is kind of the way for, for defense. And that's really interesting, the, la the last way they put this. So if there's, um, a assignment to, a uh, random task assignment to anonymous off location operators, then how are they going to prosecute somebody for murder, right? They have to have, you know, clear evidence, well, they're supposed to at least, right? Uh, clear evidence, you know. Uh, that you know, this is the person that committed the murder. Well, if there's multiple offsite uh, operators of these uh, these robots, then uh, there's there's what are they going to do? Put the robot in prison? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, like okay, you know, so I wouldn't put it, I wouldn't put it past them, but. So let's say we can. Speaking of 3D printing guns earlier, let's say we let's say there's a 3D printed I don't know Gatling gun or something. And oh, let's put some old timey flavor in there. I know. So let's say 3D printed Gatling gun because reasons. Um, or even maybe some of those uh, Nazi ones that were used during World War II, uh, whatever their names were, but whatever. Let's just say Gatling gun. 3D printed Gatling gun, uh, basically, oh, and multiple ones, uh, stationed, uh, basically provide full coverage of, let's say, an alleyway or something, because that's, you really want to defend that alleyway for whatever reason. Um, because, I don't know, maybe, maybe that's going to be kind of, um... Maybe that's the equivalent of Thermopylae in some sense, right? Let's let's force the Persians to if they're as they're attacking Sparta, let's force the Persians to kind of go along the, this bottleneck, and then we'll just defend the bottleneck, right? And part of defending the bottleneck, instead of having you know 300 Spartans, we're going to put up some you know 3D printed Gatling guns with uh, you know multiple operators behind them. That uh, yeah, so there's no actual humans. So yeah, if the Persians are stupid, they'll just become like you know meat shredded meat and whose fault is that like you didn't notice like the thousands of bullets like pinging off the side you know the the, <laughs> the alleyway walls and the the ground and all that like you guys are like that thick i mean you yep. didn't notice when some <laughs> when your first guy started a duck you know <laughs> you know duck and cover you know d you know dive and roll for cover or whatever and you guys didn't notice that, and you still plunged forward because, hey, multiple machine guns shooting all in your direction. Yeah, let's run straight into that because that's what they do in the movies. Yeah, if you guys are that stupid, maybe you shouldn't be SWAT. Actually, maybe you shouldn't be police officers. Actually, you guys shouldn't be police officers anyway because you work for the state. But let's just say in terms of competence only, you still shouldn't be SWAT of that. I mean, it's called special weapons and tactics. Where's the special tactic into running straight into an alleyway cover with 3D printed Gatling guns that are all, you know, providing full coverage where you can't hide behind crap. There's no dumpsters. There's no overhanging, um, like, fire escapes that you kind of see in, like, like, downtown buildings and all that. There's no cover. Never mind concealment. There's no cover anywhere in that alleyway. So you're dumb if you go down there. Now, if you were smarter, maybe you could find a manhole cover and kind of go underground and avoid the full coverage area and then maybe sneak around like your solid snake and then you know somehow dismantle the 3d printed you know gatling guns but that's only if you were smart maybe some swat guys are like that i don't know i could always be surprised but i seriously doubt that you know you have to keep in mind a lot of these government workers are nine to fivers right they you know it's just a job it's just a job don't get me wrong, they'll be the, the really fully dedicated guys where this is their life, but um, it's just a job. Are they really going to put themselves at that kind of a risk? I mean, guys, I mean, Jesus, these are the same kind of guys who as an industry, because that's what it is on a good day, 
these are the guys in an industry where when there's like the so-called active shooter situations, they won't actually like go into the building where the guy was last reported being and, you know, they can hear, you know, the gunshots and all that. But they won't go in until they have like 15, 20 people. It's like, oh, we can't go in until we have a goddamn battalion waiting outside. <laughs> it's like, it's like, dude, you have a fire team. For, yo, that, I mean, you can go in diamond formation. Okay, we don't have to make this complicated. People are being murdered every couple seconds when there's a real active shooter. You need to take the murderer down. Or at least, you know, shoot him in his limbs so he can't walk and he can't fight. At least in in that sense, that's called that would be that would be incapacitation at that point. So you didn't kill him, but he can't do anything either. So either kill him or incapacitate him, but fucking do something. If you guys actually claim that you represent the state and therefore, as part of say, you're supposed to protect all of us. If that's true, you kill her and incapacitate him, whichever works easier. So you don't need to wait until there's a frigging battalion of SWAT outside. You have a fire team, diamond formation. This is not that hard. The militia guys do that stuff all the time. I think some of them are better at it than others, but you think the SWAT guys would be like, halfway as competent as a civi as a civilian militia unit an unorganized militia as the government would call it you'd think but no <laughs> no 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 and no they won't do that ever oh and as a right. side note where was the militia when these active shooters are going around murdering people i mean maybe there were a couple guys but you never hear about it it's a topic for another time but regarding the blessings of technology here um, the attackers, whether they be the Yakuza, the Komora, or even, uh, you know, insert, uh, government city, uh, you know, police department here. The point being is that they're going to have to be very clever to even have a chance of maybe not getting totally mowed down when they're dealing with the anonymized remote control defense systems. That's all I'm saying. Right, right. So with the anonymized remote controlled access control, those are, uh, Ways to, uh, as 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 it said, sending out warning to everyone inside, uh, and then also uh, gives the remote bouncer a way to, uh, you know, uh, d deny access to uh, those uh, the certain the uh, certain temporary uh, the specific temporary autonomous zone. And the anonymous anonymized remote control defense systems are okay. They're in the building now. What? Uh, <laughs> they've gotten they've gotten through the uh, the access control point. And now they're in here. So what's uh, you know what do we have here in the second realm? Do we have uh, uh, oh I don't know uh, you know uh, you know less lethal robots? And the further along they get through the second realm, um, you know, as does it start becoming lethal? I mean I, I don't know. I guess it's just up to the second realm what they decide to do for their defense and their security. But uh, yeah, these seems like these seem like really uh, really incredible options, especially considering how incompetent. Um, you know the uh, the state is now they still don't really know what to do about digital currencies. Whenever you have uh, you know like uh, like a mesh network, like a, you know a mesh network there running, you know all of these things that they've never actually seen before, uh, like this this second realm infrastructure. So I, it's a really really uh, I don't know seems pretty secure if it could be put into action. Well, and again, you know it was interesting. A certain Austrian economist who shall not be named here did mention he thought it was interesting when there was like a newspaper like a corporate newspaper thing or whatever that got raided by like the british police at some point like what was it like the other year or something and um the swat or their equivalent of swat knew enough to try and find that newspaper servers and they like ripped stuff out and smashed it and all that which wasn't good obviously that's that's violation of property rights because you would think that they would try and save all that stuff to use as evidence to, like, you know, prosecute somebody. But apparently they were just interested <laughs> in destroying shit. Oh, what were they trying to hide? Um, but what was funny was that those particular – I'm trying to remember the name of the newspaper. I'm honestly um, – was it The Guardian? It might have been The Guardian or, or another one. I don't remember exactly. But what was funny was that this particular Austrian economist had mentioned that he knew several journalists that worked at this major newspaper, mainstream mainstream media newspaper. And uh, apparently everybody at the company and, and whatever uh, had already backed up all of their stuff because they were kind of anticipating <laughs> some sort of political persecution. It's like, had the SWAT officers never heard of, like, cloud computing? Have they never heard of, 
you know, a little thing called a USB drive, which you can just use to back up like lots and lots of stuff. I mean, yeah, obviously, redundant network attached storage, like like what I have, mm-hmm. what I have here. Every time I save something, it gets two copies get created. So you've got to imagine there at the Guardian or wherever it was that. Um, well, they, yeah. take, they take their data pretty seriously, so that's kind of fucking obvious. There's not going to be one copy. Oh, we got in, we deleted this one, we're good, we can take off. No, jackasses. <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 almost like, it's almost like the technological competency of the state is still thinking in terms of like Xerox photocopies or whatever, and scanning and faxes, which is fine. That technology still exists even today, obviously. But it's like they're like, oh, licky. You know, I got all, like, five photocopies of that one original document plus the original. We have everything. You have nothing. I win. And it's like, yeah, but I also made 20,000 copies of that same thing. And, like, you know, it's it's almost like uh, it's almost like the Pentagon Papers. Like, if the Pentagon Papers were to happen again, which a lot of people think it was, you know, Snowden's thing was, was kind of like that. And, eh, what the heck, let's go ahead and say so. It's kind of like, oh, yeah, let's, oh, yeah, even even if they tortured Snowden or whomever else, you know, it's kind of like, but it's already done. It's already done. There's multiple copies. You know, you can't put the genie back in the bottle. Sorry, try again later. <laughs> right, right. So the point is, so the, the point is that these, uh, there are the at remote access control and kind of the the uh, remote uh, defense systems uh, for the large portion of uh, bludgies. Uh, it would uh, provide. Uh, I, I think I would. I would. Uh, I would. I would guess, depending upon obviously the impl- implementation, this in the. Uh, entrepreneurial outfits that are handling the security and the defense uh you know it seems like a pretty viable solution um now you know with organized crime they're a little more creative right so maybe it'll be a a little bit of a hiccup for them maybe it wouldn't work i don't know i guess it just come down to the individual organization and how technologically inclined they were so anyway let's go ahead and move forward here two areas in which technology can help us shall be explored in the following the oppression by the first realm forces us to employ methods to conceal our actions and and to leave no evidence behind Anonymous communication technologies, many of which are available right now, allow us to send and receive messages, surf the web, and offer digital services in a way that neither sender nor recipient can be identified by third parties. So we'll just stop and, and briefly discuss each of these. So anonymous communication, yeah, blessings of technology, that's huge. That is huge, especially in the age of you know the surveillance state. That PGP still works, and uh, that was verified by Paul Rosenberg in my interview with him. If it's, if it's uh, you know, implemented correctly, then you know, they, you know, it'll take them hundreds of years to figure out what the hell was set in that email. Um, anonymous communication, yeah, that's, that's big. It's here. You need to start using it if you aren't already. And uh, you know, if you want to get started, download Signal or Telegram on your smartphone. Uh, but I would, uh, you know, don't stop there. <laughs> you know, con- continue on with, uh, with all forms of your communications. So a big one, definitely. That's what you introduced me to a few years back and helped me get PGP set up, which I greatly appreciate. Yeah, and obviously I want to kind of go along further with that and kind of I'm going to have to redo, you know, ZRTP and a few other things as well. But yes, I, I think I think PGP is kind of like the baseline. Um, that's like that's like the first th- I would suggest that's like the first thing people do, because once you get access to Internet, then you need to be able to like send and receive emails. That's kind of basic and unique to Internet. So start there, then you can kind of, in a sense, upgrade to using uh, internet like a phone, which is where ZRTP comes in. And then, of course, uh, OTR is basically just the equivalent for, like, instant messages. So, I mean, you can kind of do that one, and then ZRTP, whatever, but... Sure. I mean, that's kind of where I'm coming at it. And signal that smartphone app. Uh, And obviously, it's on a smartphone, so there's already, you know, some issues there, as Jamie Baconic has pointed out. But uh, Signal does implement, you know, as an open... Oh, I don't remember the uh, oh, the the organization, but it's Edward Snowden recommended. It's what you know. That's what Snowden uses Signal. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, it offers the you know offers phone, maybe video chat too. I don't I don't think so. Maybe well, either way, you can do uh, voice chats, instant messaging. Uh, you know, really secret chats. Uh, they're called yeah, they're called secret chats. I think, and uh, there's no possible way. Uh, literally, no. It makes them even more secure than they than they already are. So, um, you know, Signal can do a lot of these things. Obviously, again, it's on a smartphone, and you know, they do have access to the like they they can capture capture what you say before it's actually in- sent encrypted and sent. So that's a problem. But uh, but yeah, I, th- I think PGP is a great first step, and uh, a lot of people don't use email anymore, but uh, a lot of people still do. So. There's no reason not to, to to get it set up. It only takes about an hour, and uh, I've been using it for three years, uh, three years, and I've never had any issues. There was one point for about a month where I couldn't send, uh, or where I couldn't encrypt or decrypt files that were sent to me 
but it resolved itself after a month. I just didn't mess with it. But that's the only hiccup mm-hmm. I've had in so far. So easy to use. Go ahead and use it if you're if you're just you know as as they say in the in this uh, in this uh, in this book, privacy is property. We're trying to you know protect what what a totalitarian outer world wants to steal from us, which is our privacy. So implement anonymous communication technologies. It's a no-brainer, especially for anarchists, right? Why the hell would you want the state to be able to read or you know, hear whatever you say or do? Yeah, exactly. And so since people do use email, they do use instant messages, and they do use uh, VoIP, voice over internet protocol, then why wouldn't you encrypt each one of those forms of communication with PGP, OTR, and ZRTP respectively? Why wouldn't you? Unless it's like, and, and again, that, I mean, that that's kind of its own kind of, you know, related issues is that why is there kind of the reluctance and or laziness and or just outright refusal of people to do that? And there that's there's kind of long and varied reasons. What I think is positive going into the future is that is that that kind of digital cryptography is being made more and more user friendly, which I think will eventually lead to yes. wider and wider adoption in much the same way that you look at cryptocurrencies, which are now getting much more user friendly, which I think leads to, again, wider adoption. So I think I think there is a I think there is a I don't even think it's correlational anymore. I think it's causative where if you have a technology that becomes more user friendly, you have wider adoption. Yeah. Yeah. And in regards to the second realm. Um, you know, mentioned we've mentioned before that these these second realms can be purely digital, uh, and if they're deep web, if they're dealing with uh, dealing in the black and gray markets, it's got to be encrypted. So anonymous communication is kind of a baseline for uh, for second realms. So uh, the next one, darknet systems give us the leverage we need to operate our own access controlled and anonymous communication networks as an inconspicuous overlay of the internet. So what they're talking about is I2P here, Internet Invisibility Project. Uh, it's anonymous layer. Or it's an anonymous layer over the normal internet, uh, from the clear net to the dark net. So from the first realm to the second realm, to put it in these terms. I haven't done a whole lot with I two P, but I you know got I downloaded it, tested it out, did some things. Works well, pretty user friendly, and um, yeah, dark net systems are are fantastic. That's where these uh, deep web marketplaces are. That's where these deep web IRC chats are. Uh, like the one I was in uh, with uh, with Smuggler, the author of this book. Uh, that's where those things are. They're on the dark net. They're not in the clear net. They're in the dark net, the second realm technology. Yeah. I would say that you just need to be careful which type of technology you're using to, I shouldn't say access, but like use as a dark net. So we kind of now know that Tor, although it might have been usable at one point, may not necessarily be so because now there have been people who have been getting in trouble Uh, when they've been doing some activities on tour, thinking that it may have been useful to them. That is not to say that other types of darknet systems don't work better. Um, But I am saying, you know, do your due diligence and try to, you know, keep an eye out for whenever whenever there's like security gaps regarding certain forms of of something that can let you access darknets. Right, Um, right. So they're not they're not created equal. Let me put it that way. Yeah, so so use Tor. Obviously, that's that's great, but uh, uh, take extra security steps online beyond that, um, just in case, <laughs> right? So uh, encryption allows us to send messages only uh, intended recipients can read. So we kind of jumped ahead a little bit. So there's anonymous communication technologies where uh, neither the sender nor the recipient can be, uh, can be identified by third parties. And there's encryption, which actually encrypts the messages, which we've already kind of covered. But do you have anything else there? I would say that encryption doesn't just have to be high tech. It, it can also be low tech. Like there was that double encryption sure. method that Gary Hunt kind of um, came up with that I more enumerated and and like wrote down. Um, I'm I'm a big fan of that because I think it's a good idea to mix low tech with high tech, so that even if shall we say one layer of encryption was hypothetically broken, you know, good luck to your opponents. Uh, trying to crack that second one, whether it be high tech or low tech, it doesn't matter which one. By the by, the virtue of the fact that you're using a mixture of them, both high and, and low tech encryption, uh, that's that's going to really throw th- throw them for a loop. So you know, hypothetically, if it was really easy to crack like a, a low tech encryption, 
then good luck breaking, you know, yeah, PGP, right? Or go right. the other way. Let's hypothetically say that OTR was really easy to break. I'm not saying that. I'm saying hypothetically, let's say OTR was, was easy to break. Well, if you were communicating in Pig Latin or maybe something a little bit more sophisticated on Pig Latin that I'm not going to mention here because that is tradecraft, by the way. Um, so for purpose of public consumption, let's call it Pig Latin, even though it's not Pig Latin. If you're using the low-tech Pig Latin, uh, once the hypothetical bad OTR uh, got broken, then unless your opponents know how to read the Pig Latin, then good luck figuring out what you're saying, even though they, they broke the digital stuff. So it doesn't matter whether the high-tech or the low-tech gets broken first. By virtue of the fact there's another one means your opponents are working that much harder. And then if they really were able to break through both, and maybe they do deserve to read listener and or whatever else the white is <laughs> saying. I'm just saying, like, if they had worked that hard, maybe they deserve to listen to it. And maybe you should do, you, you know... Probably, you probably wouldn't, even be, wouldn't, be, wouldn't even be alive anymore, so... Well, uh, that so too. That. <laughs> well, that too. But I'm also kind of saying that... You know, maybe they deserve to listen to it, and maybe you should do a better job of doing your own encryption or whatever, you know, just saying. Right. All right, digital signatures enable us to phys to digitally sign contracts in unforgeable ways so that remote and pseud pseudonymous trading can be implemented. Now, this is what, you know, happens with uh, cryptocurrencies, the, uh, the private and public keys and, you know, signatures, and then also with PGP, Kyle, I'm sure you've seen the signatures there. Uh, they're d digital signatures to verify that you're t talking to, to, to the correct person. So... Yeah, that's big. That's big. Uh, I don't know what else to say about that. Well, it's really just kind of... How do I put this? Oh, yeah, and by the way, when they talk about digital signatures, they're not saying, like, where you, um, you know, sign a form on your... on Where you sign, like, a bank form online. That's not what we're talking about, digital signatures here. This is dig actual, you know, second-realm digital signatures, not just consenting to have your signature be digitally instead of physically. So, clarification. Yeah. Well, I, I think what's kind of going on here is pretty much... How do I put this? Um, it's... I mean, I, if I remember correctly, my history here, digital signatures, di digital signatures started in large part based off of PGP, right? Because the idea was that making sure that who you received an, e an encrypted email from really came from that one yes. person. Yes. So a lot of that kind of, kind of uh, the, and the development of digital signatures beyond PGP really kind of stemmed from, you know, Phil Zimmerman. So, you know, just saying. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Uh, next, anonymous untraceable digital cash makes our transactions invisible to outsiders and breaks any attempt to freeze all of our assets or identify the volume or parties of our trades. Yeah, this one's big for the uh, second realm folks. They used, they, uh, used something called open transactions for some time. Uh, and that was what they used. Uh, a lot of them used that instead of Bitcoin uh, initially. So for you guys that think, you know, Bitcoin was like, yeah, uh, well, Bitcoin was the first, sure. The, I guess the first that did what it did. But uh, there's something else called open transactions that uh, a lot of the second realmers preferred. But yeah, this one's this one's obviously big, obviously big. Uh, anonymous, untraceable digital cash. Thankfully, that's you know that's not hard to obtain now, and it's not hard to trade with it. Uh, it's actually quite easy. So uh, that's that's big, right? I mean, transactions happen in the second realm, both digitally and physically. And uh, whether those things are illicit or not, the existence of the second realm is already enough of a uh, worry to the state that uh, it's always best to to, to be. To be us, uh, better be safe than sorry. Yeah, um, I I would just say maybe perhaps that. How do I put this? Oh yeah. Although by I the appreciate. Way, by the way, sorry. It's okay. Um. So the the second realm folks actually the reason they used open transactions was because they were one of the first groups of people to realize that Bitcoin is not anonymous. The Silk Road people could have learned from them. But go ahead. Well, yeah. That I think I think that's fair enough. Just that just as a historical point. I appreciate the description of anonymous, untraceable digital cash as such. However, couldn't however doesn't cryptocurrency just kind of get to the point of it real quick? I mean, isn't that what they basically mean, or do they mean something else? Uh, that's that's what they mean, yeah. But uh, I mean, it, it, they might have chosen that verbiage, and these folks are crypto anarchists. So um, I mean, digital currencies are ones that are not anonymous. And cryptocurrencies are one that are anonymous, or that are anonymous. So they could have used cryptocurrencies, I guess. But yeah, I, I guess I mean I don't know. Cryptocurrencies might work, but yeah, I don't know why they chose that phrasing. 
I don't know. Maybe, no. I'll, maybe I'll smuggle her in the Interplex RSC shit. No kidding. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I had on that one. Okay. All right. So the next one, mobility and remoteness, empowers us to act without being physically present, thus removing operators from environments of high threat and making things like secure counter surveillance, blackmail resistant physical address access control, and physical trading machines possible. Now, I'm sure some of you guys have heard of uh, you know a guy named Ross Ulbricht. Uh, you know the uh, the site that he was uh, that he you know was claimed to have started the Silk Road. It's exactly what that provided: mobility and remoteness. Unfortunately, due to the illegalization of drugs, a black market is created, which makes it a, vi- a very violent, uh, and in many cases, a very violent uh, you know occupation is of being a drug dealer. So, what the Silk Road did was they removed people from those those dark alleys, and uh, you know <laughs> they got the drugs delivered to their house. It's a big thing, and in regards to invulnerability to coercion, it increases it a lot. Uh, it really, really does. Um, now, mobility and remoteness also enables the digital second realms um, that do that uh, you know do exist out there. They do exist. Uh, they really do. So, I don't really have much else there, but you know, mobility and remoteness is is absolutely huge, and uh, that's something you know that uh, the internet has provided to us too. But hopefully, here in the near future, there's already the technology is already out there, but it's got to be more users of it. But uh, we'll have uh, our mesh networks, uh, you know, here soon uh, <laughs> for the second realm infrastructure. But go ahead, Kyle. Well, you know, kind of what was mentioned in an earlier episode on this uh, second realm series, you know, those kind of that kind of opaqueness and some of those other um, some of those other uh, uh, tools and, yeah, and opaqueness, things. Compartmentalization, uh, pseudonymity, anonymity. Um, yeah, et cetera, et cetera. Right. I'm thinking also, I'm trying to remember exactly the specific examples that were used as forms of like trade craft, uh, such as like those uh, trading windows or whatever, where the traders can't right. see each other and they have to use like both arms or whatever. Like that stuff is, it seems pretty cool um, as, as far as I can kind of figure it. Um, so when you talk about like blackmail resistant physical access control, I guess those uh, trading windows or whatever, you know, again, like the description went, kind of like um, the bullet resistant, you know, windows for that are used at banks, but it provides two way protection, not just one way. Right. I think I think that's pretty much where, the, you know, in terms of like a physical second realm infrastructure goes, I think that's really kind of where it's going. Um, I think at this rate, the only thing really left to do is actually just like build a prototype, I think is really kind of, kind of where I'm more kind of coming at it at. Right, right. And that black bail resistant physical access control that was referred to in, uh, the earlier in this episode when we talked about, uh, I'm not going to try to remember the phrasing, but the anonymous, uh, you know, digital access control and the, the security aspects, but mm-hmm. having, um, Multiple, multiple operators in different locations prevents one of them from being, and then they have to, you know, agree on an action, um, you know, whether to, you know, uh, kill this bludgy or, uh, you know, let them in or whatever the decision is. Uh, it, repre- it prevents one of those people from being blackmailed by the bludgies uh, to cooperate because it's irrelevant, right? If the, if the other three people say, okay, yep, we're doing this, and he votes no, the, the way that uh, the bludgies want him to, it makes it irrelevant. So it makes uh, blackmail a non-issue, at least uh, in that regard. So the, tra- the trading tables, just to kind of reiterate from the other episode, it was the trading tables where both sides, they can be reached from both sides only by harder observed corridors and that feature a barrier between the parties that cannot be easily climbed over and which conceal the identity of both parties. And they have to hold each other with one hand during the trade preventing one side from running away with only one half the transaction having taken place and use the other hand to move goods between them. The trading tables resemble a bank counter except in protecting both sides equally. I think the next step at this point, Shane, honestly, is to ta- kind of take as uh, building a prototype of trading ta- of second realm trading tables. That, I think, is really kind of the next step um, as, as far as to actually trying to make like, uh, in terms of, as this series is about building the second realm is actually building the trading tables. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. I agree. It'd be, it'd be good to get an actual concrete idea of what these things would look like and how they would work. Yeah, I agree. Uh, all right. This next one, secret sharing and secret splitting gives us opportunities to distribute decisions and secrets over many parties that can only act when a predefined threshold of agreement is reached. This can be used to create both secure escrow systems and strong pseudonyms that are able to bear long-term reputation. Uh, so it sounds like 
uh, what they're saying here is, uh, I guess, distributed consensus, uh, distributed consens- consensus networks, uh, secret sharing and secret splitting. Interesting. I like it. Yeah, but, you know, this is kind of like what was mentioned in the other episode, too, about contract registries and then combining it with escrow and bonding services. Um, I guess if you also did that on a – or even like a bonded escrow, um, if you were to kind of combine that with like a pseudonym, kind of like a DBA, like, do, like, a, like oh, I'm doing business as John Doe or whatever, you know, John Doe's plumbing. You know, um, if you were to combine a contract registry with like a bonded escrow – for a DBA, that actually might be a really good way on on how to actually like you know hang out your proverbial shingle, you know your business actually start. That actually could be a way of actually uh, as a model for starting a second round business. Is that as and long still as you're retaining on- your anonymity and and you know mm-hmm. pseudonymity if if it's that. Right, while because also, while also being able to build a reputation on the back of that business name. Mm-hmm, because you're doing it as a DBA. So, you know, as long as you're on the contract registry, you've got some sort of, you know, bonded escrow. And then, of course, actually, don't don't forget the enforcement part, the evidence retention systems, and then, of course, have some mediation and arbitration and all that. Um, I, I think I think those are different elements of, of, of that can be used to help build the second realm and, and help instill, like, you know, I don't want to say customer confidence, but basically a trust, customer trust. Let, let's let's use that word. I like that word a lot better because people kind of misplaced conf- the word confidence. Customer trust. If there's a way to actually retain that trust and, and retain that business, especially repeat customers, right? <laughs> um, I, I I think that can help you know make them feel that their their trust was earned, that their business was earned, and that they would like to. Retain that trust, retain that business. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Uh, distributed consent, the ability to trigger an action only if remote, often anonymous, predefined parties agree on the action. This makes coercion, blackmail, and sting operations against us much harder while giving the involved parties plausible deniability. Uh, kind of, yeah, that's kind of what we just talked about, right? Um, yeah, distributed consent. I mean, that's what uh, these uh, these DAOs, these distributed autonomous or the decentralized autonomous organizations are, uh, that are you know uh, DAOs is what there's uh, you know I guess the short short term uh, that uh, you know a lot of uh, blockchains or I guess a lot of uh, digital currencies are implementing uh, as a way to I guess uh, I don't like the word. Damn it, I, don't, I can't think of a better word for it or a better term for it now. Digital democracy, god damn it, I don't like it. Um, <laughs> Wait, no, no, if you're going to say it, you have to say it the way they do. Digital democracy. It's so sexy, digital democracy. I don't I know. Co- what, com- I mean, community-based, we'll just put it that way. Yeah, where the decisions are made by the community. Uh, fine. Yeah, we'll go with that. Yeah, I don't like digital democracy. That's, you know, those, yeah. Digital democracy. <laughs> Bad. <laughs> Disgusting. Rule by mob. Would you like three thousand tyrant? Oh yeah. Would you like one tyrant three thousand miles away, or three thousand tyrants one mile away? Oh, by the way, all power to the people. I mean the tyrants. I mean the. I mean the democracy. The rule by Come the on, mob. Aren't we the? Aren't aren't uh, you know we the government? I don't know. Yes, we are the government. I get to coerce everyone else, provided I can persuade enough people to coerce my neighbor. Christ. All right, let's move forward. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> geocaching offers some solutions for physical trades in which the selling party is at risk. Placing the goods at a hidden location and communicating the coordinates to the buyer afterwards allows goods to travel without both parties having to meet. And that's that's a really good idea. I mean, we, we've talked a lot about digital second realms where, uh, you know, that's it's obviously anonymous encrypted communication and, you know, cryptocurrencies are used uh, as a medi- medium of exchange. Well, there are still physical goods and trades that need to happen. And uh, having this sort of thing, it's kind of like a, a storage cache, right? Um, only using one for trade. So I yeah I like that idea too. It seems like they've thought of most everything here. <laughs> <clears throat> so such seem to be the case. Yeah. Um, the only thing I'll add about geocaching is that this could be combined with like supply caches, the physical ones. Um, yeah, I, I I think I think that's kind of interesting because usually the idea of supply caches, like in the context of the so-called preppers, I think was good. But the geocaching is interesting because now you're basically taking the idea of a supply cache, combining it with some sort of like digital communication, something or another, and then using it as a form of trade with a second party. So that's kind of going beyond 
uh, the preppers uh, kind of were doing where it's all like hush hush only I know where my hidden PVC pipe is kind of thing, uh, which is interesting. It's it's a further I think geocaching in the way that they're meaning it here is a further development upon the original idea of supply caching where in an emergency my bug out crap and rifles is located, you know, and on BLM lamb located at this latitude and longitude and so forth. Um, yeah, geocaching is interesting because now we're at, like trading, right? Actually, you know what it really sounds like? It sounds like the digital version of uh, like doing a drop. Yes, yes, a drop point, yeah. Yeah, a drop point. That's what it's more sounds like. Yeah, I agree. I agree. So that's all the excerpts we have. So I guess it's time for, I guess, closing thoughts and kind of wrapping up this episode. And I guess the 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 point I'd like to make really clear to the listeners is that you know the the, ble- the blessings of technology are i mean like this is this is what people are so excited about with, about with cryptocurrencies especially anarchists in particular because you know they're great tools for freedom and i think people are starting to actually realize that it's not just a currency they can do a lot of other things like build the technology for the second realm so um not only can it do that uh you know the technology, uh, you know, building the second realm. But this technology will be used to maintain and defend existing ones, too. And uh, it'll constantly be developing. New strategies and tactics will be developed. And but I guess the, the point is here that these technologies exist. They exist. Everything that we need is is here for second realms to be built, technologically or otherwise. And uh, now all, all, the, all that needs to happen is, uh, you know, people need to start to... Uh, you know, building building these uh, these second realms, whether digital or physical, and there are already physical and, and digital second realms out there. But uh, which I'm sure you could join if you wanted to. But um, the idea is that there needs to be a lot of choice. We want to market selection in our second realms, right? Uh, <laughs> I think that's kind of the idea. Yeah, exactly. Um, market selection is good when it comes to technology, technology, and and such. So, like I said at the beginning of this episode, I wanted to kind of delay until roughly more or less the end, um, which kind of in some ways is kind of revisiting some stuff I said at the beginning, but now I want to kind of make it a little bit more precise in terms of pop culture references. Ooh. So technology is double-edged sword, as was said earlier. And I think when you look at pop culture, especially cyberpunk dystopias, I'm a big Deus Ex fan. And, yeah, shocker, right? And actually, as a side point, I'm actually on my second playthrough of Deus Ex Human Revolution, which is now like considered like a really old video game. Uh, it's like the story plus mode where apparently like everything is like 20 times harder and you start out with all your upgrades because like the difficulty is like really, really hard or some such thing. Anyway, what, if anybody who's familiar with Deus Ex, really any of the installments of it, of the series... Well, you kind of come up against over and over again. It's not even so much like the theme of paranoia and all that, which is somewhat relevant in this context. But it's really about like how it were even what some people try to make it into like a social justice warrior thing where they try to say that the augmented humans, the augs for short, are basically the equivalent of like uh, people with darker skin color or something. People take things in a lot of different directions. I'm simply saying if you explicitly approach the themes and ideas that were very clearly, not implied, but very clearly laid out in the storyline, the plot lines, and so forth, what you keep seeing over and over again is whether human augmentation, or you could, or as some of the characters refer to it as, is self-directed human evolution – is good, bad, indifferent, whatever. And even the multiple different endings to each installment kind of reflects this in some sense. Like, do you merge with technology in one of the games? Or in another one, uh, do you alter a particular major character's uh, broadcast that he kind of set on a tripwire? Do you have, like, an AI basically tailor the message one way or another to emphasize certain facts but de-emphasize others which would then more likely than not influence people's attitudes towards human augmentation and so forth um you know there's there's a lot of choices to be made about this kind of thing keeping that in mind one thing that kind of kept up coming up over and over again and especially in the human uh human revolution installment was that it was actually the military industrial complex that was largely financing 
the the augmentations. In fact, this was actually made very clear in the beginning, so I'm not really giving too much of the plot away, where even the protagonist is mentioning to another character about, well, in order, you know, well, this kind of seems kind of crappy. We have to accept so many, you know, Pentagon contracts in order to uh, finance the R&D for the non-violent, non-lethal, non-weaponry, basically based uh, augmentations like limbs, like like limbs for people who got amputated, or or even chips in the brain for faster processing speeds, or or just whatever. And then, of course, you look also at another kind of example of cyberpunk, which of course would be the very infamous Ghost in the Shell, which basically ah. takes which basically takes Deus Ex and ramps it up to basically... I mean, if people thought Deus Ex was transhumanist, Ghost in the Shell really is is hitting on it pretty hard. Question on that one. I was told a couple years ago to watch that. Um, or I you know, watched Ghost Don't in the watch Shell. Don't watch the remake. Don't watch the remake. I did. It's like, no, just stick to the original. There's a reason the original creeps, creeps people the hell out. I can see why, and the original's yeah, fantastic. Because, well, you know what it is? It's basically 1984, um, and it's a warning, and you can interpret the warning pretty much any way you want, um, but the ending to the uh, Scarlett Johansson version was just lame. It, it, felt, it felt like one of the – yes, I'm going to make a comic book reference now, so shoot me later, or make of your course. snide comments or whatever. But um, it, it felt like I was watching like um, one of like the D, like uh, one of the Warner Brothers produced like DCU, like Zack Snyder movies. It was just kind of like, ugh. Yeah, I know what you mean. Really. So it, it was, it was, it was like you know, I, Scarlett Johansson deserves better movies, and she's been in better movies. So I kind of felt bad. And and funny enough, like that wasn't even the worst of it because the social justice warriors were claiming like it was all whitewashing or whatever the hell, and making it a racial thing or an ethnic thing or whatever. And it's kind of like that was their most important thing. And see, my most important issue had nothing to do with so-called whitewashing. I don't care who is playing. Uh, the protagonist. I was more concerned about how watered down uh, the the intensity and and the visceralness, and also just the sheer existential weight of the themes and the ideas that were being presented in the original Ghost in the Shell. So yeah, don't bother with Scarlett Johansson yeah, too, version. It's, it's, it's too real now, so they have to water it down, huh? It's not even. Yeah, well, that's part of it. But it was also they tried to turn her like in this like a superhero like toward the end kind of thing, and it's like no 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 no. The ending that's that's the other problem. They changed the ending. The ending to the original one was so off kilter, which I don't want to spoil for anybody. It was so off kilter, and in some ways you were kind of uh, kind of like well maybe this could happen, but and see that was the other thing too. They changed the antagonist. They completely changed him, which I thought. Which which I thought. Oh crap! The ending's going to be different because now the ending isn't even isn't even like possible within the logic of the story because they completely changed him. But uh, so the ending could not have been the same. It would have to have been something else. Um, and so that's kind of. And without giving really any too more too many details away, the original ending to Ghost in the Shell is is really kind of profound. And there's a reason people are uncomfortable with it. And when I watched it, I kind of half expected it, and then I saw it happen and was like, okay, this seems like a fait accompli for me. So without giving away any details, I'll mention to you after we're, we're done here, but it was, it, it was, it was, it was, it was shocking in, in a lot of ways. But it was good. It was a good shocking. Kind of like how Winston Smith in 1984, kind of when, when he's facing and he's room, in room 101, and yes, I will spoil this, because people should know the ending of 1984 by now, but when he's in room 101 and he commits the ultimate betrayal where the rats are going through those different stages in, the, in, in you know, when he's strapped to that chair and the rats are going through those different layers of those different cages and they're about to claw his face and he finally says, do it to Julia, do it to Julia, and he betrays her. And he's never the same ever again. And, and then there's the, the the aftermath where he loves Big Brother now because he was tortured and such, and the ministry of love, of course. In some ways, I think the ending to the original Ghost in the Shell was more like that. And so there's a reason people don't like 1984. 
there's a reason people don't like the original Ghost in the Shell is because it basically kind of touches on things that makes them feel uncomfortable, which is what good fiction is supposed to do, at least in part. Now, that being said, if you look at the themes of both Deus Ex and Ghost in the Shell, they are basically trying to show how technology can be abused in such a way to basically uh, eradicate any notion of anybody's humanity. Now, it's done in different ways, of course, but the main idea is basically that the state will use technology. It's more of like an anarcho-primitivist argument. The state will essentially use technology to basically enslave all of us. Um, Deus Ex takes it up to a point, and then Ghost in the Shell goes further and basically pretty much goes all the way. Um, it's, yeah, it's, it's even the point where your own existentiality is at question. At least, at least with... Um, at least with Deus Ex, your existentiality isn't in question. It's more just if you don't have the technology, you'll basically be dead kind of thing. Um, with Ghost in the Shell, it's more are you even still human? It doesn't matter whether they take it away or not. Even if they didn't take it away, are you even still human? So it's that Ghost in the Shell is more existential. Regarding the blessings of technology, I think what's kind of important to consider is that regardless of whether your cyberpunk dystopia – uh, is one flavor or another. I think what's important is, as the authors in the book say, uh, individual autonomy. So, as, so even if you were to go to the extent of like some sort of cyberpunk fiction where you're dealing with issues of... Um, where you're dealing with issues of like integrated neural circuitry, i.e. where you're literally trying, passing information between human brains because you're linking them up physically, which is what some of the Ghost in the Shell stuff did. Um, actually, that was also part of another anime series called Psychopaths. Actually, uh, 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 yeah, I think that was what it was called, where they actually hooked people. I've actually written about this before, where they actually were hooking people up to like a massive computer grid. And Ghost in the Shell did something similar, um, where they were essentially using uh, human brains, basically a vat in the jar, uh, a, you know, kind of like a brain, you know, a vat in a jar kind of thing, uh, brain in a jar experiment. They were literally doing brain in a jar to have humans that were technically still alive, uh, but using their brain power to essentially power like a supercomputer type thing. I mean, that we're, we're talking about that kind of stuff. Yes, we totally went there. Um, and so it's kind of asking the question, like, if... An implementation of technology went in that degree, uh, it went in that sense and in that context and used for those purposes. Can those uh, brains in the jar really be said? Can really be said to have their individual autonomy respected? Hmm. And if the answer is no, then we need to find a different implementation of technology that does respect individual autonomy. Now, when you look at something like Deus Ex, you're closer to individual autonomy because now your existentiality is not in question. You get away from Ghost in the Shell, you go more towards Deus Ex, you're closer. Uh, but now you're kind of like, well, if you know people stealing limbs from each other was what some of the, in, in the plot line, I know it's kind of sounds cliched, but in some sense, oh, the criminal type stealing, whatever. Um, but, you know, it kind of almost had like an organ, hargus, uh, an organ harvesting kind of feeling to it. Um, but you know, that's kind of the thing. It's like, well, if they weren't stealing your artificial limbs that have all sort that have all sorts of tricked out gadgets and doodads or even weapons on them, then they'd be stealing your code or your wallet or anything else. So the principle hasn't changed. It's now they're just stealing a different thing of yours. Um, you know, I don't know, man. It's just, it's just, I would say individual autonomy would not be res be respected regarding technology if the technology, let's say, in a human being's body was actually owned by someone else. Because, yes, even I would concede that that's probably a version of slavery. I don't care if it's done by contract necessarily. I mean, if it's if it's that deep where if you lose your augmentations or, as in the plot line for Deus Ex, you can't afford the neuropazine injections, which basically – uh, prevents your body from rejecting the augmentations, which would kill you, or depending on the nature of your augmentations, might kill you. Uh, then yeah, then that's that's so you don't want to get into like a neuropazine addiction type thing, or have a short short supply of neuropazine, or maybe even have a the government do a false flag attack that destroys the place, the different pl place that manufacture neuropazine, and you see where this is going. So 
I think that when there is technology, it, it really needs to be used in a context that actually does respect autonomy or enhances it. I would even go the next step. And that was also something that also came up in Deus Ex, and to some degree in Ghost in the Shell, were that the people who were augmented, the augs, were actually feared by the power elite in those storylines as being, you know, H plus or humanity plus or transhumanist in that they had abilities above and beyond the normal humans. They were essentially, if not superheroes, they were essentially super powered. They were above powered. And because of that, they don't need to be constrained necessarily by human law. Oh, we have to constrain you by human laws. <laughs> or governments or much of anything else because they're powered up enough to where they can actually physically resist well enough. And that was something that also was a big plot line in uh, one of the sequels, which was Mankind Divided, because now there was a situation where now there's an apartheid because of how human revolution ended. The next installment of Deus Ex, where now you have this apartheid situation where there was actually uh, areas in the, I saw this from some of the screenshots, not to go on too long about this, but there were some screenshots where they were showing the augmented humans versus the naturals, kind of like a, a purity thing, like, oh, you're augmentation free kind of thing. But then that's kind of the interesting question is that it wasn't even necessarily is being augmented a good or bad thing. It's more how is the technology being used? Because there were certain augmented humans that were essentially real slaves and who didn't have any liberty, despite the uh, the clinics they had to go to being I the Orwellian titled Liberty and Mind and Body Clinics or Limb Clinics for short. <laughs> yeah, there 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 there's your little Orwellian double think right there. That was kind of a problem, and then you consider the whole the very existence in in the in the game's logic of neuropazine, which and then the neuropazine addictions, which that just happens kind of automatically because if you don't have that addiction. You're at risk of having your augment of having your natural body reject the augmentations, which would be a big deal. For some people, it would be more inconvenient, and then they just then they're just kind of wheelchair confined kind of thing. But for other people, it'll straight up kill them. So it just kind of depends which augmentations you have. Um, and that was that was kind of interesting too, because there was also another kind of major plot line that I don't want to get into, which was what if people, what if there was a certain genetic code or something else that made the neuropazine the neuropazine irrelevant, which basically, what if there was a natural human who could be augmented, who wouldn't need neuropazine at all, could be neuropazine independent, drug independent, who could just be augmented and then the augmentations wouldn't be rejected and could actually have real autonomy not bound to a drug or a corporation or the state or anybody. And that was actually kind of the one big plot line was that who's got the genetic code and everybody, all three, four different major special interest groups all kind of converging and trying to figure out where that code is and where the big breakthrough was. And people getting kidnapped and like all sorts of stuff happening to protect that code. Or exploit it because some people want to do other things with it and fuck up other people. All I'm saying is that when you're dealing with issues of technology, whether we're dealing with digital uh, cryptography, whether the somewhat more hypothetical human augmentation uh, or, or whatever, or even just the friggin' chair I'm sitting in, okay? I'm saying technology is neutral and can be used either way and should be used in a more positive sense to enhance liberty, to enhance Vanu. And to really have that invulnerability to coercion and to have really build that second realm. And frankly, you know, I mean, I'm not a big fan of RFID and I'm not a big fan of brain chips. However, if there is a way to have those technologies without being subservient to anyone, then I in good conscience can't demonize that particular technology or someone else using that particular technology if indeed their autonomy really is truly respected. But I think at the end of the day, Shane, that's going to be the tripping point is basically is the non-aggression principle being followed, yes or no, by this particular form of technology versus that particular form of technology. If you have a brain chip, which by the way was a plot line in one of the day of sex games, if you have a brain chip type thing – or some sort of upgrade that leads basically you're, where you're dealing now with, um, uh, with with basically the neural uh, the button the natural bodies you know uh, neurological systems and so forth. 
if you're dealing with some sort of upgrade, which was really kind of a virus that basically turned all the augmented humans temporarily in a bunch of murdering psychopaths, which then led to the apartheid in the next game, uh, if people can be manipulated that easily, then obviously there are then obviously their autonomy wasn't respected, and they shouldn't have that technology, or at least need to find out a workaround, or at least develop something that can protect them from being manipulated uh, by other people or whatever the hell. Because it was actually that particular one was actually done wireless in the game's logic. It was actually done wirelessly, um, hmm. and all that. It was yeah, it, it actually was a fal- actually was a false flag terror attack, is what it was, um, by proxy. We're basically everybody. Basically, we're just about most augmented humans were actually used as uh, as patsies. Actually, it was actually really diabolically clever. All I'm saying, because sorry, I'm trying to explain a little bit of a plot line and then try to draw the lessons from it really quick here, folks. That's why this is, sounds a little bit drawn out. What I'm trying to say is that whatever the technology is, real world, as long as individual autonomy is respected, as the authors of this book on strategy for the second realm mention, as long as individual autonomy is respected, even if you personally don't like technology A, B, C, or D, or whatever, you can't say in with a straight face that it violates liberty or vanu or whatever else if it truly doesn't. Now, if it does, and if it does render people vulnerable to attacks and coercion and whatever, then, well, yeah, obviously... That particular technology has been perverted by the state or despotic corporations or friggin' whomever else to base it or even, you know, or even organized criminal syndicates, hell, to basically turn people into a bunch of Manchurian candidates. Yeah. Yeah, I know what you mean. That's 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 a that's a really good point. It really is. And that's uh, we did an episode here on Liberty Under Attack. Jason Paradise and I did uh, back in maybe you know, maybe a year ago. And uh yeah, when you look at, uh, you know, just uh, specific technology, like blockchain technology, that shit can get scary real quick. Uh, when you look at it through the, the lens of a tyrant looking for more power, looking for more control, uh, it can look quite scary. But again, technology is a tool, and, uh, you know, the, the state is going to use it the way that they're going to use it. We know, we know, we know how, how they're going to use it. But uh, there's certainly some very incredible things that can be done with technology and uh, building second realms is uh, just one application of that. So anything else, Kyle? Yes, I want to end on a happy note, and I want to use an example of technology that has actually nothing to do with computers or the Internet, but I think kind of underscores the point about computers, the Internet, digital cryptography, and even the hypothetical human augmentation, because that's going to be the next big step. Let's talk about tanks for a minute. Tanks are a form of technology, right? And you look at World War One, you look at World War II, there was development of tanks. You know, talk about George Patton a lot. Okay, whatever. Think about this. What if the founders had to deal were, were told about tanks back when they were around? They would probably shit their britches. Well, understandable, right? I mean, these big honking things of metal run on petroleum, you know, dead plants basically. It has big explodey thing coming out of a cannon. I mean, because they understood the concept of a cannon, but like a mobile cannon that can travel like, what, 30, 40 miles an hour or whatever, heavily armored, can really be only defeated if you can either, you know, basically pop a grenade in the hatch or otherwise, you know, uh, disable the tracker or do something like that or hit it hard enough with something. I mean, the founders had to deal with tanks. I think they shit their britches. That being said... If you look at how technology just with tanks has evolved, like, yes, you've got, like, the Bradleys and, and then, of course, you know, the stuff that's that's the current more, like, MRAP type stuff and Bearcats, too. But then you can also look at technology that has enabled people to basically turn just about any uh, truck, car, plane or van almost, into basically a makeshift tank. Look, consider what the Rojavans have done. And for the most part, it works pretty well for them. You know, some people make, you know, have the tutorials on Idiot Tube about how to convert your car or truck into a zombie apocalypse vehicle. Well, basically what they're doing is that they're just, they're improvising those things, those things into becoming tanks, basically. Right? I mean, the fuel efficiency is going down to hell just because the damn thing weighs more. Okay? That's kind of common with tanks. So, yeah, you can look and say, oh, the invention of the tank as a technology is this horrible, awful thing. It's enabled the state to basically oppress people and wage wars and invade countries and blah, blah, blah. The typical anti-war stuff that I'm all in favor of, right? And uh, then, but, you know, but then we need to, like, dismantle tanks because they're awful. 
well, you know, good people can use tanks too, <laughs> right? So people can improvise and make their own tanks, uh, which may or may not necessarily be better than like a Bradley or an MRAP or a Bearcat or whatever, but, you know, has half a decent chance of not being completely blown to beds if it was just a regular car, truck, you know, train or plane or whatever. And that's all I'm saying is that technology really is a double-edged sword. So when you look at the invention of the tank as a technology, yeah, you could totally make the argument that the state is used in the military industrial complex more specifically as a way to murder and oppress people and all that, all of which is true with that specific type of example. But what's also equally true is that people can make their own tanks and have and still do, like the Rojavans. So does that mean the tank is this evil technology that can never be used and maybe we shouldn't use it? And maybe if hypothetically some of the uh, political crusaders were to do kind of like almost like a version of gun control, tank control. We need to have tank control and the brave children who, who got murdered by <laughs> and so the survivor. I mean, basically take the whole Parkland shooting thing, just replace guns with tank. You know, we need to have tank control. We need to outlaw these tanks. Who with, only with a, three three inch, uh, you know, the, the three <laughs> inch uh, barrels diameter. No no bigger than that. And you can only you can only use twenty five pound, uh, you know, uh, uh, explosive devices. Not uh, not thirty pounds. And the tank can only weigh, or actually, the tank has to weigh this much because if it's slower, then you know we can stop it easier. Uh, I don't know. Ridiculousness. Exactly. Exactly. A firearm is a technology. A chair is a technology. Money, arguably, is a technology, too. And tanks are a technology. So anything that's basically being – the wheel, the wheel, probably one of the most basic technologies ever. The wheel is a technology. A pen, the pen is mightier than the sword. The pen is a technology, just like the sword is a technology. So that's all I'm kind of saying. You can look at real life. You can look at fiction. And by the end of the day, I think the authors here write, as long as individual autonomy is respected, I think I, by, by, by certain forms and uses of technology, then the technology is, is, is a usable tool to help enhance that. Indeed. And yeah, well said. A little drawn out, but I, I was kind of wondering in a couple places, okay, where is he going with this? I'm not quite sure. But even, <laughs> even if it's a 20 minute, like, uh, I guess, introduction, where, where you bury the lead for 20 minutes, you always get back to it. So I'm just kind of, you know, you got to be patient and just wait for it. It's going to happen. It's going to be good. But uh, just never know where we're, where we're I don't I never know the starting point, the, the, you know, what's going on in the middle and then where it's going to end. So it's always, I don't know, it's interesting. It keeps me on my toes. I've heard you put down about everybody that's run for president lately. Who should we be looking at for the next election? Nobody that they offer you. See, you don't have a choice. You don't choose who runs, and you think that if you elect one or the other, that you're going to get a good choice. I'm telling you, it doesn't matter who you elect if the people didn't choose them. And the people never do. Not only that, but there's a misconception in this country. You think your vote counts. Your vote doesn't count. The president is elected by the electoral college, not the popular vote. What are we going to do? Well, we've got to wake up, number one. The biggest, the biggest goal, the biggest task that we have in front of us is to educate the millions of people that inhabit this country and the world. It's not just us that's in danger. It's the entire world. The New World Order will be a totalitarian socialist government. A benevolent despotism is what those at the top call it. I don't even understand it. Most people don't. So what do you suggest we do? Well, just sit back and. No, don't sit back. A, you need to. Uh, AK-47. And... No. No. You should have. You should have something on hand in case everything falls apart to protect yourself, your family, and your community. But uh, what I'm advocating is that if enough of us wake up. If enough of us wake up and really become responsible and understand really what's happening and how the system works and understand that this is not a democracy, it's a republic, and democracies never work, they always deteriorate into socialism, and then a dictator rises up and takes charge. And eventually, if democracy lasts that long, it destroys itself with immorality and licentiousness. Look at the old Roman Empire, which began as a... As a a democracy 
Look at all the democracies that sprang up and tried to survive in the past. Look what happened to them. You see, when you have one man, one vote, the people basically are selfish. They're greedy. They always vote themselves everything that they can possibly get until there's nothing left and everything disintegrates. If you want to sit back and let it happen, well, that's your choice, but I'm not sitting back and letting it happen. I'm just one person just like you. Educate your family, educate your neighbors, educate your community. Take our country back as a republic. Become once again what we were intended to be. Up for and by the people means that we have to know everything that's happening in Washington all the time. We are supposed to be the arbiters of our own faith. We must be the watchdogs of our government. We began as sovereign kings in our own right when this country was formed and the government was our chattel servant. We are quickly becoming the property of the government, which is becoming once again the Roman Empire. Now, this will eventually collapse too, but when it collapses, it will collapse into anarchy and race wars will begin to rage across the landscape and people will kill you for a can of spinach in your cabinet. And I asked you, should I go and buy me a gunner? Protect myself? And you said no. No, that's not what I said. I said that you should have those items on hand to protect yourself, your family, and your community. Didn't I? I should already have that stuff already bought. That's right. That's why our forefathers gave us the second article and amendment to the Constitution was so that we could protect ourselves against a government should it become despotic and oppressive. And from a it's coming. I believe that. It's coming. Yes, it is coming. Very fast. The purpose of this program is to wake the sheeple, empower the people, and try to save this nation and thus freedom for the world. You see, if we lose our Constitution and Bill of Rights, freedom will fall everywhere in the world that it exists. This is the only place in the world that has a chance to stave off socialism. Socialism has always destroyed everything that it has ever touched. It takes everything away from you, including your dignity and self-respect and you reach a state of total dependency where the government becomes your father and you become a helpless child and you pretend to work and they pretend to pay you. Is that what you want? 